For at least one game Saturday, the fourth-ranked team in the state Class 1A ratings was better than the fourth-ranked team in the state Class 4A ratings. Walnut's Warriors played the highly-rated Des Moines School in a revised tournament Saturday on the Tri-Center field outside of Neola. After falling behind 7-1 to one in the third inning, the Warriors rallied for six runs in the bottom of the inning and held East scoreless the rest of the way for a 9-7 win. Gross was the winning pitcher despite allowing 11 hits in seven innings. The Warriors committed five errors in the game but also helped themselves with several good defensive plays. Sampson's two doubles led the offense, followed by Sewer with two singles, Hansen and Jensen each added doubles, while Cook, Martin, and Hillwick each singled. 1996 Walnut is a quiet village in the township of Layton in Pottawatomie County, southwest Iowa. It was formed as a railroad town in 1871 as a stop along the Chicago, Rock Island, and Pacific Line. Today it is well known as Iowa's antique city and most recently has become a regional center of wind turbine electrical generation. This is part two of the story of another of Walnut's claims to fame, baseball. The Supreme Court, in a far-reaching action recently, held that state officers may search private dwellings without a search warrant and use evidence to secure convictions for violations of state prohibition laws. October 31, 1929 Professor A. M. Buswell of Illinois estimates that a ton of corn stalks will yield from 10,000 to 20,000 cubic feet of gas. The pith in the stalk produces gas and the residue becomes better fitted for paper making. It offers a new vision for farmers everywhere. October 31, 1929 The People's Savings Bank, organized at Avoca in 1913, closed its doors during the last hour of business Saturday. It is the third bank to close in southwest Iowa within the last month. December 26, 1929 The Walnut Jail is getting to be a very popular rooming house with the Knights of the Road. During the month of January, just past 44 hobos registered at the jail at the electric light plant for a night's lodging. These weary willies range in age from 70 to 16 years young. The 70-year-old guest said he left home when he was 19 years of age and had not been back since. They all make themselves right at home, sleep, cook, and eat at the jail. One beau will use a bucket to take a bath in or wash out his socks, while the next fellow will take the same bucket in which to make his coffee for breakfast. So far this month, 14 have registered for lodging, seven of whom were rumors last night. February 6, 1930 A walnut man is said to have gone fishing the other day, forgetting his bait. Looking around for something to use, he saw a snake with a frog in its mouth. He put his foot on the snake and took the frog away. The snake seemed so forlorn that the fisherman thought he ought to give it something in return. So he took a bottle of hooch from his pocket and put a little into the snake's mouth. A few minutes later, while he was watching his cork bob on the water, he felt something biting him slightly in the back. 
as if to attract his attention. There was the snake with another frog. The Walnut Bureau, 1930. Walnut's high school baseball team was down 8-3 to three after four innings. They stormed back and down two runs in the seventh and final inning. Gress got a two-out walk. Leonard Seaver singled and up came George Felker who hit a three-bagger which tied the game. Earl Noon was up next and got a single bringing in Felker to win the game. Walnut 11, Adair 10. April 15, 1930. Friday found the Walnut Cardinals primed for battle with Oakland as their second conference foe. The boys went on the field with a clean slate and battle in their eye. They are out after the Nishna Valley title, and if they continue to play airtight ball, the team that takes the cup will know how they got it. The spectacular catch of Seavers of a hotline drive brought the crowd to their feet while the ever-presence of McNeil's big glove kept would-be hitters trotting benchward. More power to you, Cardinals. April 17, 1930. The year of 1931 will go into history with memories of struggles to meet taxes and loan payments. Also cash rent with prices of farm products going lower and lower toward the close of the year. Most of us made the grade, although it is very common to read in almost every paper of some foreclosure or transfer of property one to another. Some have borrowed on life insurance policies to meet the emergency thinking 31 was an unusual year and looking forward to this year for a raise in prices. But to our dismay, we are beginning the new year with prices lower than we people can remember. Corn is selling off the ground at 15 cents. Hogs, 3.25 to $4. Cream, 20 cents. Eggs, 10 cents in trade with no reduction in taxes or indebtedness. The prospect is pretty disheartening. There is no branch of farming or stock raising which offers any promise of profit over production cost. What shall we do? Not raise anything? Clara Ackerman, Cass County, Iowa. From her diary, February 1932. Tell me about the Depression years. What you can remember of them. south of Walnut when the banks closed. I remember Dad coming home. He was banking with the Hector Bank, they called it. That's, that was the bank on the corner where, where Dr. Weir had his office. And he come home and said the bank had closed. At that time, he didn't have what little money he had, he had in there. And uh, people were out of work, naturally. Uh, and there wasn't any money. Plus, uh, the monetary depression, we had dry weather. The drought, the dirty thirties, they call it. Uh, it hit here, it didn't hit here as hard as it did in Nebraska and Kansas and Oklahoma, but uh, it, it 
did hit here too. So there wasn't hardly any crops raised. Impossible that the country could go through that and not come out without a revolution. Today, I pray there would be a revolution if the people had to go through what they went through then. Miss Carr. Use the word fascinate in a sentence. Norman. My sister has a dress with twelve hooks, but she can only fasten eight. May 1931. On a cold, raw day, threatened with rain, the Cardinal and Black Baseball Nine journeyed to Avoca for a last athletic encounter with our honorable enemies for four of our men, namely Earl Noon, Paul Hamilton, Irwin Hansen, and Fred McNeil. With center field hole plugged and left field played in veteran fashion, the Cardinal's million-dollar infield backed up Noon's hard, fast pitching in A1 shape. Let us not mention stars of the game, for as in a real aggregation, the boys were all stars, and we feel sure that the outgoing members of the team will leave their attire of athletic warfare with a satisfied air, having procured their ancient foe's scalp on their last encounter. Walnut 7, Avoca 4, May 14, 1931. Right here. There it is. Oh. Mm. Oh. Good try, Coach. Go talk to us, Hunters. Got to believe. Got to believe. Got him. Got him. It's in there.
you guys. Father, you see the guy. Hey, we gotta be competitive like that. Sometimes you just gotta. Hey. There he goes. Go oh my God, that's so amazing. Bill Donahoe, Huey Armstrong, Newell Forbes, and Lynn and Durwood Stahl went to Avoca Wednesday afternoon for a swim in the pool. About five o'clock they decided if they could not get a ride home, they would hop a freight train. This they did, and lo and behold, it was a through freight. Didn't even hesitate in Walnut. So they landed in Atlantic about seven o'clock. They hitchhiked back to Walnut, arriving here about eleven o'clock, proving the old saying, the shortest way home is the longest way around. August 23, 1932. In 1933, the U.S. economy had hit rock bottom, and FDR's New Deal promised relief to all. Bonnie and Clyde were still on the loose in Missouri. Prohibition was near its end. The legend of the Loch Ness Monster was just beginning. King Kong had just opened in movie theaters. And Hitler's Nazi machine was just getting started with an all-out assault on German Jews. In Walnut, only one of three banks remained. But on the baseball side of things, it was one of our best years ever. Harry Neiman and a few other members of Area American Legion Posts began a Junior Legion Baseball League. Boys aged 9 through 17 were invited to join up, and soon a full schedule with Walnut, Avoca, Oakland, Hancock, Carson, Macedonia, Minden, and Neola was begun. 
At Harry's first practice, more than 30 boys signed up. In addition to the juniors, our high school team was doing well, with Harold Jonk leading the way. Heine Holtz and his married men were playing a regular schedule of kitten ball against the local singleites, and Harry Neiman was still behind the plate catching Harold LaFrance on the local town team. The American Legion Junior League Baseball team defeated Macedonia Tuesday in one of the best exhibitions of junior baseball ever seen. This is the first defeat of the year for Macedonia. They probably have two of the best batters in the league, but they were unable to do very much with the offerings of Rogers. The fielding of Moore, Donahoe, and Fisher was airtight, exhibiting many sensational stops and putouts. The most exciting thing of the game was when Bill Donahoe made a home run with two on. The ball went way over the head of the left fielder and they never did find the ball. June 8, 1933 <laughs>
Thinking back through the years, I have been trying to identify the man for whom I had great admiration. One name, Harry Neiman, is always present. Harry played ball with my dad. He was a catcher and a pretty good one, too. He wasn't grand of stature. As a matter of fact, he was somewhat bow-legged and pigeon-toed. He was a World War I veteran, married with no children, a businessman of just moderate success. He coached hundreds of boys throughout his life, teaching the game of baseball. He was also my Boy Scout leader. His favorite expression, and one I had never heard before or since, was, Don't get your dauber down. Now, I still don't know what a dauber is, or even if that is the symbol he was using, or if it just sounded like dauber. My purpose here in introducing Harry is that he symbolized so many characteristics which make a man remembered. Service to others with a good demeanor may be our greatest gift to our friends and acquaintances. Railroads, Corn Silk, and Long Johns by Don Fisher December 1995of the Great Depression, baseball was still king across America. It provided a great way to put aside worries and enjoy some entertainment at a very low cost. It was no different in Walnut, which had established itself as a baseball town over the past 35 years. Memories of great town teams of the past were the foundation for the establishment of a new team. Walnut businessmen donated money for new uniforms and equipment and a new young crop of talent was selected from the local high school teams of the recent past. Competition was very keen for one of the 12 positions on the team. Walnut was clad in brand new red and white uniforms and played as good as they looked. They came to be known as the Walnut Red Sox and even though other teams recruited paid players from the Western League, Walnut's only real recruit was Francis Pickrell, who was a star pitcher on the Iowa Hawkeyes baseball team. The Red Sox became the first Walnut Town team in two decades that did not include Harry Neiman behind the plate. He was replaced by 24-year-old George Felker, who was also team captain.
In 1938, after three years without a high school team, the Cardinals were playing baseball again. It does not appear that there was a Legion ball team after 1934, no doubt due to finances being so tight. The high school team was led by Bob Bowman, Southpaw ace pitcher, who threw a one-hitter and a no-hitter in the only two games published. The Red Sox name wasn't used, but Walnut had a good town team again, with the fast Billy Donahoe leading off once more. After the bases were full in the ninth frame with a tie score of 24 all, the Bluffs aggregation packed their old ball kit and called it a day. A dispute led to the Bluffs rag chewers walking off and hiding themselves back to the hills. July 28, 1938 Members of the Senate, of the House of Representatives, and yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. balls I ever caught. My hand would swell clear shut, so I had to put a uh, sponge in the catcher's mitt oh. in order to catch the sucker. 